Hello, welcome to the YouTube version of the Empower From Within podcast. I'm your host, Jessica West. On this show, I talk self-help, inner healing, mindset, manifestation, and impact for the creative and soul-led entrepreneur. And in case you didn't know, this is a podcast. Empower From Within is available on all major podcast platforms. So if you enjoy this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. It'll help me continue to grow the show. Thank you so much for being here today and enjoy this episode. Hi, Barb. Welcome to the Empower From Within podcast. I'm really happy to have you here today. How are you doing? I'm great. And I'm really happy to have you here, have me here too. I'm so excited <laughs> for this interview. I love the name of your podcast. What a fantastic concept. Oh, thank you so much. And yeah, I, I love everything that you do specifically like with boundary setting. I think mm -hmm. that's so important for all of us. So I'm really mm -hmm. excited to dive into that more, but before we do, do you want to tell us a little bit about your journey as to what led you to becoming a mm -hmm. boundary coach? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really important part of my story because it gives hope to a lot of people. So um, I worked at Yale University as a program coordinator for urban education, and it was mostly college access programs. I have a master's degree in sociology, so I was a professional woman. And um, in 2015, at the age of 52, having been at Yale for 17 years, I hit a codependent bottom, which even though I had been in therapy for 37 years before that and read a gajillion self-help books and done all kinds of other personal development, I had never heard that word codependent. So if there's people listening that don't know what it means, welcome to the club. Mm -hmm. um, codependent people are essentially people that are focused on that which is outside of themselves. So they're constantly worried about what other people are doing or not doing. You know, they feel responsible for fixing everything that's going on around them. The typical codependent is someone who is enabling a spouse or maybe adult child who has an addiction or substance use problem of some kind. And I um, got into 12-step recovery for codependence. So if people aren't familiar with 12-step recovery, most people have heard of Alcoholics Anonymous or AA. And so AA was the very first 12-step recovery program. It started in 1939, and now there's like 250 of them, primarily for substance use and addiction problems, but also for things like codependence um, and gambling um, and then um, very quickly, I felt a sense of relief in CODA. That's like the abbreviated name for Codependence Anonymous. And I remember saying to somebody, Jessica, I think I need to be reparented. But I didn't know that that was a thing that people do, which it is. I thought I made that term up. And then a few weeks into going to CODA, I went to go visit a friend who had been in AA for many years and had just raved about how radically her life was transformed in AA. So I was like, oh, you're going to love this. I'm going to CODA. And she said, oh, that's great. Let's see if we can find a CODA meeting and we'll go together while you're here. And she couldn't, but she found an ACA meeting, which I knew of as ACOA, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics. I did not ever think that I qualified for that program. I don't even think I gave any thought to why would adult children of alcoholics need a program. And I learned it's actually called adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. Now that I qualify for. So we go to the meeting and I was like, I'll go for you because her dad is an alcoholic and, you know, I just didn't identify. And I walk in and among other things in the opening readings, they say, we reparent ourselves. And I was like, wait, what? And then they read the list of the 14 traits of an adult child, which is affectionately called the laundry list. And I was hooked. And now my friend tells me I sobbed the whole rest of the meeting. I don't remember that, but I bought the literature. I came home to New Haven, Connecticut and started going to ACA and started getting at the core issues of what was going on for me. So what I learned is that I have something called relational trauma, sometimes referred to as little T trauma, which is as opposed to big T blunt trauma that most people think about, like you were in a war or you were in a hurricane or something like that. Um, and I uh, was getting at this uh, the core issue of trauma and intergenerational family dysfunction. 
And I would say it was the first two years, three years maybe of recovery that I went through this meandering haphazard path of learning how to build healthy boundaries, which I didn't even know anything about them. I didn't know what they were. I didn't even understand that was what I was doing in the beginning. And because my core wound is codependence and boundaries are essentially the antidote to that, they just changed everything for me. And after I got a pretty good handle on the boundaries, I started reading about them. And it was like, oh, retroactively, I came to understand, okay, this is what was going on. This is what I changed. This is what the concepts were. But as I was reading, I was like drawing images to visually depict what I was seeing in my mind. And those handout, those drawings turned into handouts, which turned into a workbook, which is the spine of my boundaries coaching program. So let me just fast forward. Um, in 2017, I ended up getting laid off from Yale and through a series of serendipitous events, started my own coaching and consulting business. And, you know, at first I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I just started sort of coaching. And then of course you have to have a niche and it just made sense for me to niche into boundaries coaching because there's so, they were such a game changer for me. Um, when I was working at Yale, even in those first two years of recovery, me alone building healthy boundaries had amazing impact on my team and the organization. So my goal now is to essentially coach former me. I'm especially, I have a fond place in my heart for professional women, especially who are older like me and um, people in 12-step recovery. I have a special place in my heart for them too. And um, I feel moved to share this at this point in the story, which is that I, one thing I did know about myself was that I never had a healthy relationship. I'm the kind of person, Jessica, who looked on the outside like I had it together. In many respects, I did. But internally, I was a mess. And I drank really heavily until I was in my 40s. I smoked barrels of weed. I'm also in recovery for compulsive overeating. I was well into the food. I was over 100 pounds overweight. And a year into my um into my recovery, ended up going to Overeaters Anonymous. I'm down over hundred pounds from my top weight. But in any case, I never had a healthy relationship and I am now in the first and only healthy relationship I've ever been in. We've been together for five and a half years and I had no idea that this level of emotional intimacy was possible. And um, so I also want to give hope to older women that, um, and even younger women, like it's not too late and you're not too old. And there are still lots of really good men out there. Just keep looking. But what's interesting is that when I built healthy boundaries, the people that I was attracted to and the people that I was attractive to changed dramatically because I started telling the truth about what was okay with me and what was not okay with me. I stopped um, putting up with things that I really didn't like or that made me uncomfortable. I stopped saying, um, yeah, I'm happy to do that when I wasn't really happy to do that. And one of the things that attracted me to my sweetheart the most is that he had really good boundaries, which makes sense because what man with healthy boundaries wants to date a woman without healthy boundaries, or what person, never mind, it doesn't need to be a heterosexual situation. But um, I thought previously that my relationship pattern was I dated emotionally unavailable men, which is true, but the real pattern was the codependence, where I was doing way more of the work than they were. And one of the things, one of the many things I discovered about myself in recovery was that I was emotionally unavailable. That's why I attracted emotionally unavailable men and was attracted to them. I used to think, oh, they're coming to me, which is true, but I was drawn to them too. I couldn't see that part. And another thing that I came to see, one of the 10 million things I came to see about myself in recovery was that subconsciously I had this belief that I was responsible for all of the good things and all my romantic relationships and whoever the guy was I was dating at the time was responsible for all of the bad things. And that's laughable now, like when you hear me say that, like there's no way that, that that's true, but that's literally how I operated. So um, learning how to build boundaries because they permeate every single area of our lives just felt right to me. 
And because I have this lived experience of 50 something years of no boundaries to having such healthy boundaries that I coach people on it, I can see things about people that they can't see about themselves. There, there's one really interesting thing that happened. There was so many interesting things that happened in recovery, but one major gift is that I'm able to look back at my previous behavior and say, here's what I was doing. Here's what I was thinking. And here's what my motives were. I was blind to it at the time, but because I can do that, I know what people, how they're thinking, what they're thinking, what they're doing, what their motives are, you know, what they're like, I didn't know I was a people pleaser. And then when I learned that I was, I learned that it's manipulative and dishonest. I thought I was nice. I thought I'm helping all these people because I'm a nice person. But when I dug into it, I realized that, you know, it's manipulative when you go about what you're doing for the express purpose of getting people's approval and that it's dishonest when you say that things are okay when they're not, or when you get resentful of people because they keep asking you to do stuff because you keep saying yes. And so um, I had no idea that I was primarily motivated by people's approval. It doesn't mean that I didn't want to help people. Of course I do. I want to be a helpful person. But when you get to the point where you're being helpful, where you're resentful, then you've gone too far and you're probably a people pleaser, which means you're their, their approval is more important to you. Like what I wanted was for people to think I was nice, to think that I was helpful, to believe that they could rely and depend on me. Meanwhile, I was lying and manipulating and not giving any uh, attention at all to what I thought of me. And that brings me to like the major shift for me. The way that when I look back at like, what was the core thing that shifted for me, for me to be able to go from no boundaries to healthy boundaries is that I came to care more what I think of me than what other people think of me. And it doesn't mean that I don't care what other people think. Of course I do. What it means is I'm no longer willing to throw my integrity out the window so that you will like me. So if I need to compromise myself to get your approval, not doing it, it's not happening anymore. But all I did was compromise myself. The way I think of it, Jessica, is that there was a lot of barb that was up for negotiation. So I could go on and on and on, but I think I'll stop there and, and uh, you know, open up the conversation. Yeah. I mean, that's great. You shared so many things. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I think it's beautiful the way you're explaining it, because like you were saying at the beginning, like you were attracting people that were codependent and you were looking for them too. But when, when it's all on the subconscious, we're not actually really aware of that. And so we form kind of like mm -hmm. just this loop, this feedback loop, and then thinking that like, mm -hmm. oh, it's just the other people and not really recognizing mm -hmm. it within ourselves. So I really love mm -hmm. that you highlighted that. And I had never... I never knew that there were this many 12 step programs, like for this amount of things. I mean, I'm someone I've only ever heard of AA. So it's very mm -hmm, interesting mm -hmm. that, you mm -hmm. know, there, there's so many things that, mm -hmm. um, that involve the 12 step. And what is it that you think was it about the 12 step recovery that really mm -hmm. allowed you to start mm -hmm. working through this? Because as you're mm -hmm. saying, you mm -hmm. know, you've spent decades with self-help books, but it was only mm -hmm. scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. You didn't actually mm -hmm do it. Yeah. So what do you think it yeah. was? Yeah. So I want to say something you just said, scratch the surface. And that's how I talk about it all the time. So not only was I in therapy for 37 years and it wasn't continuous, but close and read a gajillion self-help books. I did workshops and workbooks and work groups and spiritual groups and physical fitness and health and like nutrition and you name it. And I think of all those things that had scratched the surface of the iceberg of my life and 12 step recovery melted the iceberg of my life. So I think there's several reasons. Number one, 12-step recovery are spiritual programs, not religious, but spiritual. So um, if people know anything about 12-step recovery, they might know that people are um, encouraged to find some kind of power greater than themselves, which is often referred to as some kind of higher power. Thus the name of my business, Higher Power Coaching and Consulting. Number two, it is a step wise program. There are 12 steps and you do them in order and they are proven to have helped millions upon millions upon millions of people recover from 
the seemingly hopeless, uh, hopeless affliction of addiction, which is a disease. And number three, it is a group program. So one of the things that pretty much everybody in 12-step recovery has in common is that they isolate. Humans are wired for connection. We are addictive and compulsive in isolation, and yet we heal in community. And the beauty of being in community is not just that you get connection with random humans. You get connection with people who know what it's like for you. They think or they thought like you think. And there are people, like when you go to a recovery group, there's gonna be people all along the path, people who finished the steps, people who haven't started the steps, people who are on step four, step seven, step nine. So you're gonna to get to hear stories from all different kinds of people. And very, like stories are how we connect. Like you, like you said, like I'm telling you my story and you're identifying with it. So we hear stories of other people and we start to see ourselves in other people's stories and light bulbs go off all the time. So I think that has everything to do with it. And on top of that, because the ACA program is a trauma recovery program where you reparent yourself and you use the 12 steps to heal, I think that has a lot to do with it too because trauma is the core issue for and like we're finding out in the world that damn close to the entire human race has trauma it's a matter of degrees and when you think about it like we have been the history of humans is the history of war so all of us have had people who have been decimated by war and that stuff gets passed down to us and so um like healing the trauma but also like I, the things that came out about me, Jessica, in the first two to three years, like that, I, that I didn't have boundaries, that I had intergenerational trauma, that victim mentality was hands down the biggest paradigm shift of my recovery. I had wildly unrealistic expectations of myself, other people and the world, very serious black and white thinking. And these, these are mentalities that were just embedded in me by the culture of my family and, and much of society. And there's more, but like none, not one of those things ever came up in all of those years in, of therapy and all of the other self-development stuff. So there's this way of really, do, like we call it taking a fearless and moral inventory of yourself, which is step four in 12-step in recovery. And the way that you go about doing it is so fruitful. And I think for me, I've gotten so many gifts from recovery, but the biggest gift is what we call in recovery, understanding my part in things. So in other words, what are the things I have been doing that have been creating chaos and dysfunction in my life or making the already existing chaos and dysfunction around me worse? And some people might use that and be like, oh my God, I'm the problem. And that's victim mentality. This is empowering because if I'm the problem, then I get to be the solution. If other people are the problem, I am screwed. And so that mentality shift of I'm the problem, that is coming out of victim mentality. And I'm not the quintessential victim. You know, I, I have my victim mentality is very subtle because I'm not like, woe is me. Nobody loves me. The world is against me. That's sort of what we think of. Where I started to see it was when I did my relationship inventory and 12-step recovery. And number one, I could see my codependence get worse and worse and worse over time. And number two, what I saw was for every single man I ever dated, my thought was if he would just fill in the blank, then everything would be okay. And I saw it in relationship after relationship. And I was like, mm. so this is me acting like I have no role in the status of the relationship. And what's kind of funny, but also sad is that well before recovery, whenever friends would talk about their partners, I would say to them, <laughs> You know, you're 50% of the relationship. So you're 50% of the status of the relationship. I could see that about other people, but I couldn't see it about me. So I started to spot that in my my romantic relationships. And then as I got further in recovery, I'm like, oh, I do that at work. I do that in my family. And I do that in my friendships, literally every relationship. 
where I'm acting like if they would just basically do things the way I want, then everything would be okay. So I'm acting like I don't have a role. I can't change things. I have no responsibility. And so learning what my part is so I can change it is super empowering. One of the things that I found and that my clients find all the time is that you actually have the ability to have way more control over your life than you think you do. And it's because you're sitting around waiting for other people to change. And this is why like the serenity prayer is a staple of 12 step recovery. And I'd like to share it here just in case people don't know it. So it's God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. There is so much in there. I personally think it's really about boundaries, you know, maybe because I'm a boundaries coach, but the idea is like one of the hardest tasks of life forever will always be, can I control this or can I not control this? That wisdom to know the difference. Well, once you've discerned whether it's something you can control or not, if it's something you can't, then you need a higher power probably to help you just accept it. It doesn't mean that it's okay with you, but you stop fighting against, like it shouldn't be this way. And then for the things that you actually can control, maybe you need some courage to actually make that change. Because change is hard, but I'm living proof. And like, I've transformed my life financially, physically, emotionally, psychologically, relationally, career-wise, like in every conceivable way. Like it's, but change is hard, but so is living. So is living an inauthentic life, you know? So I feel like, you know, part of my role here on planet earth is to be a model of what's possible for people, especially in their older years. So I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> I went off on a couple of tangents there, but I'm you not did. sure if I no, answered your question. I, I really do love these these tangents. <laughs> They're beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I want to highlight what you said at the very beginning when you started. And it was like, we heal in community. And I yes. think that's so powerful because yeah, when you're reading a book on your own, it's the community being able to talk about it and then having the people who are on a similar path so that if you feel like, oh, you want to give up, which we will, because we always want to revert back Mm -hmm. to what we know, Mm -hmm, but we have mm -hmm. the people, the community that'll support us in continuing to move forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that makes all of the difference. And I love like the switch, the reframe, like when you realize that like, oh, like, you know, you can look at, I created this as like, oh, I'm a victim of this or, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I created that. That means I get to create the solution. And I think that's so powerful. And it's reminding me to go back to something that you said earlier on when you were talking about, you were a people pleaser. I think many of us are like many women, you know, Mm -hmm. myself included recovering people pleaser. And I think like, it's so powerful when you recognize that, wait a second, being a people pleaser is actually manipulative Mm -hmm. and dishonest. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes Mm -hmm. just that reframe almost like lightens up the whole Mm -hmm. situation. And so how was that realization for you? And did you feel like it was so much easier to really overcome Mm -hmm. when you realized exactly what it was that you were doing? Well, at first I thought I was a horrible person. Hmm. I used it as, okay, this is one of my favorite sayings from recovery. It's info, not ammo. So what that means is when you learn something about yourself, for example, that you're manipulative and dishonest, it's information for you to learn, integrate, and grow from. It is not ammunition to beat yourself up. Because let's face it, if we could beat ourselves up into a better versions of ourselves, we would have done it right now. When you beat yourself up, you end up battered and bruised, and that is no place from which to grow and change. So initially I was like, oh my God, I'm a horrible person. And then I realized, wait a minute, this this behavior came from somewhere. It came from my childhood and it worked because I'm alive. I made it out of my childhood, right? It's just not working for me anymore, especially not as a woman who wants to be an honest woman of integrity. And, you know, another thing that, you know, that came out for me in recovery was that I was a very dishonest. I truly believed I was an honest person. So not only was I lying in the people pleasing department, I lied about drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and relationships and all different kinds of things. But once I got past the, and started using this information as info, not ammo, I was like, I do not want to be manipulative. 
And I do not want to be honest. And I start to see all of these, like I had the impulse to lie very frequently. I, I call it managing my image. And that goes to what I mentioned about my core being able to make the shift. I'm managing my image because I care way more what people think of me than who I actually am. So I wanted people to believe that I was a woman of integrity. And that was more important to me than being a woman of integrity. So I wanted you to think that I was reliable and dependable and, and uh, you know, um, trustworthy and all that kind of stuff. And I would bend over backwards to make you believe that. Meanwhile, I wasn't actually those things. And now what's more important to me is to be those things. And if you don't perceive me that way, that's on you. I can't, I don't, I can't make you perceive me a certain way, but I know, and God knows that I am in integrity with myself. So I was so focused on being in integrity with you, which I wasn't, but I thought I was, that I gave no um, attention to being in integrity with myself. So to me, that's one of the things that I talk about with my clients all the time is that what I'm trying to help you do is be in integrity with yourself. And one of the most important ways I do that with my clients is I have them start by figuring out what are their top five values. And then we use those values as guideposts for our behavior. So when and where do we set boundaries? We do it in alignment with what matters to us. So if you say that your health is important to you and yet you're not doing anything to support and promote your health, you're out of integrity with yourself. So what are the boundaries that you can put in place to promote and support your health? So you're going to have financial boundaries where you're going to dedicate money towards things like exercise equipment or maybe classes, maybe organic foods or something like that. You're going to have time boundaries where you're going to actually spend time regularly promoting and supporting your health. And one of the things that people that stops people from setting boundaries is the feelings of guilt and shame. And it's because they care so much what other people think about them. And it's a lot easier to the eventually the the guilt and the shame sort of goes away when you start making more and more decisions in alignment with what's important to you. So let's let me just continue the idea of health. So if somebody says to me, oh, Barb, I want you to go out to Sunday brunch with me at 11. We're going to this buffet. I'm going to decline. Number one, I follow a food plan and I eat meals at approximately the same time every day. 11 o'clock doesn't work for me. Number two, I really try not to socialize around food anymore. It doesn't mean I never do, but I try to do things like go for coffee or go for a walk or something like that. Number three, buffets don't work for me. I'm a recovering compulsive overeater. I have a problem with quantities of food. And so I don't need a giant table of food for me. And so if they're going to judge me, I might say something like, oh, I'm not going to come to brunch, but I'd love to have coffee with you sometime, or maybe we can go for a walk another time. If someone's going to judge me because I'm declining and I'm doing it to support and promote my health, I can live with that in a way that if it was just for no reason might be harder for me. And it helps me to keep the focus on myself and remember that I care what I think of me. And I want people's approval. I want people to like me, but I don't need it in the way that I used to because I like me and I approve of me because I'm living in alignment with my values. Mm -hmm. That's really the most important thing, right? Because if you don't mm -hmm. approve of you, no one else is going to approve of you. Like we're kind of like that beacon, that energy center. And if we're not mm -hmm. vibrating in yeah. approval or, you know, just mm -hmm. being that we cannot mm -hmm. attract it on the mm -hmm. outside world, like no matter how right. you try, right? Yeah. Really powerful. I love that you touched on values because that's something that I'm really big on and, you know, work with my clients as well in, in a different kind of light, but really knowing our own personal values is really the foundations that we know how to show up and create a fulfilled right. life. So I love that you touched on that. So let's get into the boundaries because you've, you now help women set those mm -hmm. healthy boundaries and you've based mm -hmm. it kind of off of your experience in 12 mm -hmm. steps. So would mm -hmm. you be willing 
to kind of like go through, I mean, we won't have that much time, but if you can like touch on some, some of the key points that like someone mm -hmm. listening could really mm -hmm. start setting up those boundaries for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I start with is, is, um, altering people's mindset. It's the foundation. I mean, for everything in life really. And so <clears throat> I gave you that quote info, not ammo. That's one of the most important things. Like that's one of the top things that, uh, people say that they get out of working with me is really internalizing it's info, not ammo. Um, <clears throat> another like quick mindset shift is this notion of harms versus hurts. So a lot of people don't want to set boundaries because they're afraid to hurt people's feelings. Well, there's a difference between harming someone and hurting someone. So it might hurt to use a needle to take a splinter out of your finger, but it's not going to harm you. In fact, it's going to heal you. Well, it might hurt someone's feelings to set a boundary with them, but it's not going to harm them. In fact, it might heal the relationship because you're being honest with them about what's okay and what's not. Truth be told, you could actually lose some relationships. And um, that that is the case. And if it's especially in a toxic or abusive relationship, you probably need to lose that relationship. But at minimum, it's going to heal your relationship with yourself because you're showing up for yourself in a way that you never have before. So I start with mindset. The next thing that the next module is about developing empowered communication so I thought I was a good communicator. And in some ways I was, I was a program coordinator. So it was like a hub of information flowing. So in that way, but interpersonally, I was not. So I grew up in a family where you did not engage in direct communication. You talked to all the people around you. So I didn't learn how to directly and clearly communicate. So I did things like imply things, beat around the bush, expect people should know things, um, tried to read people's minds, expected them to read my mind. And so I really like bring this out to the forefront and be like, okay, we're not doing that anymore. And here's what it looks like to have clear and direct communication. So I get, I walk people through like examples. I have all these different tips for um, communicating your boundaries. So um, I'll just give a couple of them. Like the number one is be prompt, do it immediately. Don't wait for the right time. I used to always wait for the right time. And the right time is now. So I think it's a Chinese proverb that says something like the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. The next best time is today. Well, the best time to set a boundary was when you met the person. The next best time is right now in this moment. So it doesn't get easier when you wait. You, you, your tension goes away. Like it's difficult to set a boundary, but when you do it, you've done it and it's over with and you get peace of mind. Whereas if you keep waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the right moment, the tension builds, your resentment builds and all that. And it's also respectful to the other person to let them know, hey, that doesn't work for me. And um, another one is what I call um, naming the terms of the engagement. So, you know, I was a volunteer alcoholic before recovery. So people asked me to do stuff all the time. And I got resentful that they like, I can't believe she just asked me for the 50th time. And it's like, well, I said yes, 49 times. So that's why she asked me. So um, I started, like, if somebody asked me to do something, um, I will um, often come back with, I can't do that, but here's what I can do. And when you, and, and maybe give them two alternatives, but if I come back and say, I can't do that, but I can do this, I've named the terms of the engagement and they're much more likely to go with what I've proposed, which is just like when you raise little children, you don't go, what shorts do you want to wear? You go, do you want the blue shorts or do you want the red shorts? Because they're so much more likely to pick from within those choices. And when we have too many choices, you know, that's too much. So that's the second module. Um, the third module is about shedding our masks. So for many of us, um, we've been chameleons, if we're a people pleaser. You know, we're acting like we like things that we don't. We project these images and therefore we get defensive because we don't want people to see behind them. So like one of my masks was, I have my shit together at all times, in all circumstances, 365 days a year. And I do have it together a lot of times, but not 365 days a year in every circumstance. I had this idea that I had to have it or I had to at least project that I had it together, that I had the answers for everything, that you could be counted on me for absolutely anything. And I've, you know, that's just unsustainable. And I had this idea that I wasn't supposed to have flaws. And here's another one of my favorite sayings from recovery. And it's this term, flossum. 
So we're both flawed and awesome. And when I heard that, it was like, wait, I can be flawed and awesome. It's not one or the other. I'd somehow internalized the idea that I shouldn't have flaws. And if I had them, I damn well better hide them. And so when I started to open up the idea that I could actually be flawed, I stopped judging myself so much. I started sharing my flaws with people. And lo and behold, that leads to intimacy when you're vulnerable with people. And then when I stopped judging myself, Jessica, I stopped judging other people so much. So, um, and then, you know, I could, I have 12 modules. That's just the first three. Mm-hmm. I think um, if there were one thing that I always try to leave people with, it's the idea keep the focus on yourself. And a lot of people think that means to be selfish. That's not what it means at all. It means when you're focused out there in the world on people, places, and things, you cannot control those things. So it's an endless drain on your energy. When you focus on yourself, you actually can have impact there and it's energizing. So I suggest four ways to keep the focus on yourself. Number one, ask what do I want or need in this situation? I never asked myself that. In the beginning, you're not going to be able to give it to yourself, but just start asking. Number two, is this my business really? I don't know about you, but I spent my time giving unsolicited advice, foisting my help on people who didn't necessarily even define their situations as needing help. And so now, like, it's fine to help people, but please get their consent. Let them consent. Hey, are you looking for advice? I have some thoughts. Would you like to hear them? Or better yet, wait until they help. I mean, excuse me, wait until they ask for help. Um, The third way is like the phrase we use in recovery is what's my part in things. So this is that I'm the problem thing we were talking about earlier. If you're involved in a dynamic that appears throughout your life and has for years, you're the common denominator. And this is not, this is info, not ammo. So what might you do differently going forward? What have you been doing to contribute to the situation? And when you change your end of the dynamic, things will change. And then the fourth way to keep the focus on yourself, which is my favorite, is take really good care of yourself. And I mean on a consistent basis. So I used to try to pour from an empty cup. Now I've learned to pour from the overflow. So the only way that I can have overflow is if I fill my cup first. So when I say take good care of yourself, I mean, what energizes you? What gives you energy? And what gives me energy might not give you energy. In fact, it might drain you. And what gives you energy might drain me. So we get to decide our own program of, you know, taking really good care of ourselves. So, and I don't mean things like getting your nails done and your hair done. That's like maintenance. I'm talking like what fills your cup. For me, it's primarily conscious contact with my higher power. I meditate twice a day for 30 minutes every single day. I have a whole big long, I call it like my runway into the day where I meditate and I journal and I say affirmations and I do yoga and all that stuff. And I have a similar, not quite as long runway out of my day. And I, um, I spend time with people that energize me and I don't spend time with people that drain me. So those are, you know, my, my things that hopefully people will be able to walk away from listening to this with some concrete things that they can do. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm sure they will. Everyone will. Like you've really shared so much and I love those four steps and the first three that you mentioned. And on on the third one, like it almost makes me think like, you know, when we feel like, or sorry, it was the second one, like shedding the masks. And um, when we feel like we can't have any flaws, we need to be perfect. It's almost like this unrealistic view of the world. Like, Mm -hmm. do we really think that people are perfect and flawless? Like, why would we be, you know, so different from the rest? Like everybody has issues. And I think like when we do get so caught up, just maybe in the wrong way in our own world, just thinking like, oh, it's just me. I'm the only one like this. I need to hide it. But it's like yeah. putting it out there that really allows us to really connect right. with people. And, you know, I, I say often too, like when we're, when we're being our authentic self, 
it's almost like the best thing that we can do for others because we're telling them, we're giving them the opportunity to think, do mm. I want this person in my life? You yes. know? Whereas if we're yeah. trying to just camouflage ourselves like to their world, we're not being mm -hmm. honest or authentic and we can't really expect to have a real nourishing relationship with them or sustainable relationship because mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. truthful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Barb, you... I love the phrase nourishing relationship. I love, like, I'm just like literally internalizing that. I love that phrase nourishing. You can't have a nourishing relationship when you're faking the funk with people. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Absolutely. Barb, I, I, again, like you've shared so many things. Thank you so much. Is there any last words that you want to share? And do you want to let everybody know where they can find you if they want to learn more? Yeah. Well, my last words are usually um, keep the focus on yourself, but I think I'll just end with, you know, you are Flossom. You are mm -hmm. Flossom. And then uh, my favorite places to hang out on social media are on Instagram at Higher Power Coaching and LinkedIn at Barb Nangle. That's N as a neighbor, A-N-G-L-E. And then I have a podcast too. It's called Fragmented to Whole, Life Lessons from 12-Step Recovery. I've been doing it since March of 2019. So as of the time of this recording, I have 278 episodes, over 30 of which are about boundaries. So they can either hop on over to the, you know, if they're on a podcast app or they can go to fragmentedtohole.com. And then I, I do private and group coaching for women on boundaries. Um, I mean, private coaching I would do with a man, um, but not group coaching. And all that stuff is linked in the in my bio on Instagram. And of course on my website, which you will get to when you go to fragmentedwhole.com. Okay. Amazing. All of those links will be in the show notes of this episode. So be sure to check them out. And Barb, again, thank you so much for being here today. It was really so good talking to you. Thank you. I appreciated it.